Uh, the Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. Uh, we have started the book of Genesis, and thank God we are slowly, systematically going through. And we have taken the time to show uh, that it is a most important book to get a feel of to get a grasp of, to get a basic yet fundamental understanding of so that we can appreciate the rest of the books that comprise the Bible. Genesis, as we said since we started, is a book of beginnings, the origin of things as we know it. And we are happy that we have taken the time to go through this most important of books. We want to quickly jump in so that we can do a brief review and then continue on, amen, in the series that we have started. There are some things that we have said, and one of the things we want to be clear on is that we cannot extract every single thing from the book uh, as if we were going verse by verse. It is possible, but it's going to take a very long time. So we have gone the route of basically going through and giving us a survey of the book of Genesis, pointing out, highlighting some critical events, some critical things that happened in the book. And by doing that, we get a good feel for the book. And then we move to extract particular learning points, points that we can see principles from which we can extract and apply to our lives. And that is extremely important. We will see, as we have started already to look at, that in the book of Genesis, it speaks to the, the beginning of life as we know it, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of family life, the, the beginning of civilization, the beginning of nations, so to speak. It speaks to the beginning of everything. Now, we had categorized the book into some divisions. We had looked at also some things that we can extract chapter by chapter in terms of the historical items that are there. And I want us to quickly review some of the points that we have gone through already, you know, just to refresh our minds, refresh our memories, and then provide a basis for us to continue on. But it is a, and it will be a most interesting study, a most interesting review of this book and I ask that we take the time you know don't let it run away and leave us go back and look and keep abreast and try as best as we possibly can to stay atop of the things that we are looking through so many questions will arise from the book of Genesis uh, in our first discourse we indicated that of all the books in the Bible, this one, more than any other, is the one that is under the most severe attack because it speaks to how things came about. And Satan literally attacks the book of Genesis because if you can uh, cause to be, uh, you know, waving, wavery in the minds of people, the origins and how it came. If we can cause people to think twice about how authentic the book is. It speaks about in the beginning God and it, it sounds hard to grasp because God just stepped forth and did what he had to do without making any reference to exactly who he is, without making any reference to where he came from. It just said, in the beginning, God. And that God expects us because for sure he would have planted something inside of the buildup of humankind for them to understand and appreciate that there is in fact 
and indeed a creator. And so he just said, in the beginning, God. And then he placed the mountains in place and he put everything that we now see and know in our existing world, the, the universe as wide and broad as it is. And he expects us, by virtue of the things that we see around us, to put it together and know and understand and appreciate that there had to be an intelligent mind. There had to be a supreme being, a creator, for things to be as it is now. And so Satan literally attacks this book and allows for his minions to pull men in to the school system, yes, the university system, to come up with ideas and positions that totally deny the existence of a God. Men tell us, as we said before, how the world came into place. There was a big bang and we happened to end up as intelligent human beings. We happen to end up with fishes in the sea, with the animals on the land, with the trees and the flowers and the beauty as we see it. And it just came about by chance. And God laughs. And I want us to understand that our going through this book is going to bring some things to light to allow us to rethink some of the things that we have heard and also to strengthen our faith in the God of all ages. So let us quickly run through. There are some objectives, and I want us to turn to the screen and look at the slides as we do a quick review. There are some objectives that we had uh, set out at the beginning. And just to quickly run through, we want to make sure that when we go through this book of Genesis, we leave with some very important things. There are some takeaways. And firstly, we want to make sure, and as we go through this book, it provides a survey, right? Going through Genesis, we want to make sure that we have a good overview of the book of Genesis and get a clear picture, a clear understanding, a clear breakdown of the importance important themes that are highlighted in the book. So that is one of the takeaways we are going to have as we go through. We want to be sure we're going to get a good overview, a good overall feel. We will survey the book and so we have a gist, a clear picture of what is contained in the entire book of Genesis. Then two, it is to build our faith, yes, in the things that are written in the book. The book is authentic. We want to show, we want us to be clear when we start to see the puzzle uh, coming together and the pieces fitting together. When we start to see some things that were clearly outlined in Genesis and then we start over thousands of years to see them coming together, then we will recognize that the book has to be God-inspired. And so to build our faith and, and show that the book is authentic. Then thirdly, to outline and to give an outline of the important purpose for the book of Genesis. Genesis was written for a reason. It, it is a book that provides information on the beginning of all things as we see. There is a purpose for the book. And when we are through, we will see clearly the purpose for the book of Genesis. And then finally, to answer crucial questions that naturally would arise when studying the book. There, there are questions that so many have, both within church and out of church. We made mention of some of these last week. We won't go back through the questions or some of the questions. But when we are completed in terms of the survey and looking at the visions of the book and showing the things that we want to present to us, then we are going to drill down a little bit further into the book of Genesis. And by doing that, 
we are going to get to some of the questions that bottle the mind of many. We are going to get to those. And so that is very important. So the, 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 the objectives are clear and we want to be sure that upon completion we meet all of those objectives. We did say that the name Genesis means beginning and the book as it is has 50 chapters and gives us a history of the origin of all things. Now, we had highlighted the, the different themes from a historical perspective on an almost chapter-by-chapter chapter basis, save and except that some chapters we kind of lumped together. So we had indicated that chapter 1 uh, from verse 1 to 25 give a historical uh, perspective in terms of the world as we know it. In chapter 1 from 26 over to chapter 2 down to verse 25, it speaks about humanity. These are themes coming down in the different chapters of the book of Genesis. Chapter 3, the first seven verses spoke about sin being in the world. Chapter 3 from 8 down to the end spoke of the promise of redemption. Then chapter 4 verses 1 to 15 speaks of family life. And then from chapter 4 verse 16 down to chapter 9 down to the end, it spoke about man-made civilization. As we go over into chapters 10 and 11, it speaks about the nation of the then known world. So that from chapters 1 right down to chapter 11, it gives us a breakdown of things from the creation right down to the nations of the world starting to emerge and to come forward. From chapters 12, however, to chapter 50, it gives a breakdown of the human race and the, the, the Hebrew, sorry, the Hebrew race. And specifically, it speaks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and closes off with Joseph, the son of Jacob. And it speaks also about his death. And so it is important that we get a feel for the, the themes in terms of the, what happened in the different chapters, the history, the main points that come out from each chapter, amen, from chapter 1 all the way down to chapter 50. In terms of the scope of the book of Genesis, we indicated that Genesis covers the time from creation to the death of Joseph. And the entire book from chapter 1 right down to chapter 50 uh, covers a period of about 2,315 years. And this is uh, according to a chronology that was put together by Archbishop Usher, some theologian from way back. Uh, information is though that what he had put together and the measurement and the mathematical methodology that he utilized, it was very consistent and so many have worked with this. So you're talking about the book of Genesis, of one right down to chapter 50, covering a massive period of time, 2,300 and odd years. So we are looking at the scope of the book. We then went on and went into the divisions of the book. We outlined that the book is divided, are broken down into nine major divisions. Chapters 1 to 2 spoke about creation. Chapter 3, the fall. Chapter 4, the first civilization. Chapters 5 to 9, the flood. Chapters 10 and 11, the dispersion of nations. Chapters 12 to 25 spoke about Abraham. Chapters 17 to 35, Isaac. Chapters 25 to 35, Jacob. Notice that some of the chapters overlap. 
It means that while Abraham was alive and his son Isaac was there, when the grandson Jacob was born, I, Abraham was still around. There is an overlap. By the time that we get to Joseph, again, there is an overlap, chapters 30 to 50. So earlier on, we outlined that chapters 12 to 50 spoke about the Hebrew race. But here, in terms of the divisions, as we break it down, we are giving us the chapters that speak about Abraham, the chapters that speak about Isaac, the chapters that speak about Jacob, and the chapters that speak about Joseph. And these are the patriarchs, so to speak, of the nation of Israel. And so we are going to go down now to pick up from where we left off. When we last met, we had looked at the first division, which spoke uh, to creation, and we had done a little bit in going through there. Then the second division, we spoke about the fall of man, and we took the time out to consider what happened there, the temptation, and pretty much how Satan does his things. You know, God gave Eve a word, and he gave Adam a word, and he told them what to do. But then the adversary comes, as he always does, and he lies. And it is important, I might just stick the point in here, uh, just to expand, just for a brief moment on what we said the last time. I want us to notice that when Satan came to Eve, he said, did God say? And as he started to talk to her, he gave her a part of what God said. He gave her a part of what God said. And it is very important that we pick that up. He gave her a part of what God said. And he said, did he say that you are going to... And he went on and he outlined what it, it is that God said. But you always notice it is one thing for him to tell an outright lie. But notice that Satan told her a part of what God said. And then he told her a part that was totally lie. So there was a part truth and a part lie. And that is always the strategy. God said the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And then Satan now went to her and said, you will not surely die. That was a lie. That was opposed to what God literally said. But yet there was a part of it that was true because their eyes would have been opened, their understanding would have been open, their knowledge base of things would have been open, and that was true, and that happened. But then he went on to say, you will not surely die. And that was totally a lie because they did die. Immediately they died spiritually, and ultimately they died physically. So that there was a part truth to what Satan said, and there was a part lie and that is the most dangerous thing that we must always be aware of it is one thing if a blatant lie comes up from the enemy and you can know that this is a lie but you see when satan comes and uses deception deception is when there is a part truth and a part lie and it mixes together and the part that is true is so true that you feel comfortable so that when the lie comes we are unable to decipher because there was some truth. It is the heart of deception and Satan is the master of it. So he mixes truth with lies and that is most dangerous and we need to be aware of the wiles, of the tactics, of the strategies of the enemy and it comes out fully right here in the book of Genesis. And so the vision to spoke to the the fall of man. And then now, Division 3, uh, we had indicated that Division 3 spoke to the first civilization. And, you, you know, we won't go into that. We'll spend some time there. So at this point, we are at Division 4, the flood. And I want us to just position our eyes on the slide at this time as we take our time and we go through the fourth division. Remember, there are nine of them, and we are now onto the flood, division four. 
and this takes us through chapters 5 to 9, the flood. All right, so we are on, we are on um, Division 4, and we are talking about the flood. It is important that we pick up, that we see that chapter number 5 contains a genealogy of Adam, and it spoke to his descendants, and it is so contrasting in terms of the, the, the positions that these two sons of Adam took. Uh, those that were the descent descendants of Cain, we call them the Cainites. Not the Canaanites, no, but the Cainites, you know, the descendants of Cain. They were corrupt and they were sinful. And then there was Cain's brother who was Seth. Remember now, Cain had killed Abel because of jealousy, and envy. Remember, God had accepted the offering, the sacrifice of Abel and rejected the sacrifice, the offering of Cain. And out of jealousy, he, he murdered his brother. But then Adam and Eve had another son who was Seth. And his descendants were godly and righteous. I want us to note that over time, and this is very important, we are, we are showing here that Cain's descendant, they were corrupt, they were sinful. And notice what happens as early as the book of Genesis. It is the nature of men. I imagine for the simple reason that the fall took place. Our tendency is always towards sin and towards unrighteousness. Even if we have a good heart, even if we start out on a good path, even if initially we are going the right way, we always will be contending with that flesh man. We always will be contending with that heart and that mind that want to go opposite to what God wants. And there are learning uh, things for us right here, right in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. It is showing us something. Even those, the descendants of Seth, who were godly and who were righteous. Notice two brothers going two different directions. One sinful, one righteous. One want God, one did not want him. But notice that over time, Seth and his descendants were influenced by the sins of their cousins. In other words, the, as they started to multiply, as they started to reproduce, then we observe that the influence of the sinful ones seem to have been stronger than the influence that was exerted by the righteous ones over to them. So those that were corrupt and sinful somehow had a greater influence over the others. And it seems evident right from the beginning that as godly and righteous people, we ought to be aware of our surroundings. We ought to be aware of what we are confronted with. We are to be aware of who we are. Because if we dare to just go through and leave ourselves open, leave ourselves unchecked, it is just a matter of time that the evil influence will overtake us. Two different paths at the beginning, Cain and his descendants, Seth and his descendants. One followed God, one opposed God. But as time went on, and we are going to see it, as time went on, those that were the descendants of Seth were influenced by the sins and the unrighteousness 
of their cousins, of their other family members. However, Noah and his family remained true to God. A small number out of a large pool. Again, this was as it was in the beginning. Notice that way down in time, Jesus came. And Jesus made a particular statement that is consistent with what we are seeing right here in the book of Genesis. Jesus spoke about the road being broad that leads to destruction. And then he speaks about the road that was narrow that leads to life everlasting. It is the same thing we are seeing here. Out of a large group, it was only Noah and his family that remained true to God and who later on went into the ark and were safe. And that is important. So saints of God, as we take our time and we look through the divisions in this book, I want us to extract some of the lessons to be learned and apply them and see clearly what is being presented to us. Now, within chapters 5 to 9, it let us understand that Noah was chosen for the royal line of the Redeemer. Yes, God looked down and let us, let us look what happened. God looked down on the sins of humanity and his justice literally demanded judgment. So remember now, at this time, it was the descendants of Cain. It was the descendants of Seth. And they were multiplying. But as they came down, as they came down, and I, I do believe that over time, Adam and Eve had more children, but the one that seemed to be calling on the name of the Lord would have been Seth and his descendants. And what we find is that over time, the, the righteous group somehow lost what it was that they had where God was concerned because of the influence of the other till it reached to the point where their sins came up before God. And so God then instructed Noah to go ahead to build an ark for the saving of his family for he, the Lord, was going to destroy the world with a flood. They became so violent. They became so sinful. They became so wicked that their sins came up before the nostrils of Almighty God. And he was going to deal with them. Now, listen. While God saw Noah and his family, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God was willing to save his family, there was something that had to be done. Unless they found shelter in the ark, all living creatures would have been destroyed. So that in as much as God was going to cover, was intent on saving Noah, he prepared an escape route, and that was via the ark. And once they were in the ark, it was important for them to know that they would be safe. And this is a lesson that our own world should learn from Noah. It is important that we understand that things were so bad, the people reveled in their unrighteousness, the folks, all they were doing, they were up and they were down and they were feasting, and they were carrying on and they were indulging in every imaginable form of pleasure. And they had literally forgotten God. And brothers and sisters, it is important that we learn something here. I want us to compare Genesis chapter 6 with St. Matthew chapter 24. We don't have to read it. 
I just want us to know that there is a comparison, Genesis chapter 6 and Matthew 24. We see that the conditions in the days of Noah were so very similar to what Jesus said was going to be happening based on Matthew 24 in the end the days of the end of time. And that is very, very, very important. They were similar. Yes, it was an advanced civilization at the time. The things that they were doing, just like now, when we look at the, the, the increase in knowledge base and the advancement of technology, a high civilization and all that is happening with our people today is that where is the next party? Where is the next session? Where can I find the, the prettiest girls? Where will be the, in, the, in, the, in the terminology of those that have decided to go that way? Where can we find the men's club? And all of the things that were happening back there in Noah's time, brothers and sisters, they are happening right here today. And so a comparison was made brothers and sisters, by Jesus, back to the book of Genesis, back to the book of beginnings. And we are seeing that folks left their place of being godly people, folks left their place of being righteous people, and they were sucked in by the system around them. I have no doubt that they were made to believe that nothing is wrong with this. You can do this, you can do that. And before you know it, their minds and their hearts were turned away from God to follow after pleasure and to follow after the system of this world. And notice, the descendants of Seth were many and they were the godly descendants. And yet when the judgment came, not one of them were there. It was only Noah and his family alone. It is not how people start. It is not where we start. It is not the fact that we started. What is important is that we hold out to the end. What is important is that we maintain our walk with God and we are extracting this lesson right from the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. So many things are there for us to understand and true to his word God sent the flood which destroyed the earth and what a terrible situation it was but following the, 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 the destruction following the deluge following all the catastrophe associated with his judgment he also sent a rainbow the rainbow was the covenant sign that God would never destroy the world again by water. And that is such a gracious act by Almighty God. But before we go on, uh, let me just pause on this slide. I, I, you know, I, I, every now and then I go ahead of myself, but since we are here, I really want us to mention of something and I just I just want to slip it in. I can't bother to wait for later on. Let me slip this one in now. Because in chapter 5, if we go back up to verses 21 and 24, and you can just follow me here. Um, if you go back up to tw verses 21 and 24, we realize coming down, the men's heart was just desperately wicked. They were continuing in their sin. And the death of men are recorded in an unbroken chain they just died they died the consequence of sin they died until Enoch the Bible told us about Enoch and he did not die God took him the Bible said Enoch walked with God and God took him in other words he was taken up he was taken away from the earth he did not die he did not see death and that is happening where brothers and sisters in the book of Genesis this is very significant because all men ought to die that was the pronouncement 
in terms of the, 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 the judgment that was passed down on humankind because of their sin. You will surely die, and both spiritually and physically. So coming down the line, men died. They died, they died. But then something different happened with Enoch. But notice, Enoch walked with God. Enoch pleased God. And that is very significant. And so the Bible said God took him. He was taken up. And what is clear, what we are seeing right here, brothers and sisters, is that Enoch, right there in the book of Genesis, is being presented as a type of the church. Today, we know that it is appointed unto man once to die. And then after that, the judgment. We know that we will all sleep. We know that that is certain. However, there is a group of people, just like how there was Enoch, who will not see that, but who, like Enoch, will be taken out of this world. And right there in Genesis, we are seeing a type of the rapture. We are seeing a type of the church being raptured in the book of Genesis. Brothers and sisters, I am telling us that as we go through, we are going to find that this is not just a book of stories, but there are lessons throughout the book. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church, was prefigured right here in the flood, right here in the book of Genesis. And it is very significant. And I want us to use this as we try to present to us so that we can understand to help to build our faith that this book is authentic. But not only that, we, we find that Noah, it took him and his children about 120 years to build. But then Noah and his family, and of course we know two of every animal that was around, went into the ark. But guess what? The judgment came. They were in the ark. They went through the judgment, but they were protected from the effects of the judgment. Enoch was taken out. He typified the church and the rapture, taken out before the flood. Noah, however, just like the 144,000 who will be here on earth, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are going to go through the tribulation, but they are going to be sealed and they are going to be protected and they are going to withstand. And Noah represented or symbolized this group that went through the judgment and the judgment of the great tribulation in the days that are to come. And they went through, but they were safe. Just like Noah and his family went through the judgment. The flood was there. They were on top of it, safe in the ark. He and his family. And that was symbolic, typified. The one 44,000 Jews who went through the tribulation, but was protected from it. What a God. What a story. What an event, what deep things coming out at us right from the book of Genesis, right from the book of beginnings. And so it is important, brothers and sisters, that we take the time out and that we recognize that although we are doing the survey and although we are seeing things happening, we can, from the things that are happening, from the things that are emerging, we are seeing serious typologies. We are seeing serious symbolisms. 
we are seeing serious things. And these are not just something that comes up out of our mind because when we go back to the New Testament, we are going to be seeing some reference by the apostles in their writings going all the way back to Genesis for us to know that there is a linkage. And that is very, very significant. And so, as we close off on division chapter 4, or division number 4, sorry, we are realizing that after the flood, God, Noah was told uh, that he was to go out and to replenish the earth. Uh, we see that he then chose Shem as the seed through whom the Redeemer, Genesis chapter number 9, gives us that. Because Noah had his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and God chose Shem, that son that he was going to cause coming through his lineage. Messiah, the Redeemer. And as we go down, we are going to see more of this. So we continue with our survey and we move now to the vision number five, the dispersion of nations. And that we, we look at. Um, and this is chapters number number 10 and 11 it gives us a nice breakdown uh, of the sons of Noah, Ham, the father of Canaan, Canaan, Shem, and Japheth. Now, there are some questions that folks normally ask. There are some legitimate questions they are, I must say that folks normally ask. And while we will not give us all the details at all this evening, because you know we just want to take the time and just quickly gloss over and survey so we have a basic understanding of what happened at the different points in time and what the different chapters show, it is important that we recognize that the nations of the world that we know today emerged from the loins of these three sons of Noah. When the flood was over, no flesh was alive in terms of humankind save and accept for Noah and his children. All other human life was eradicated. God purged the earth so that it is impossible for anybody to come with a position that said there had to be people. Some might have es escaped the flood or it is impossible. The Bible makes it clear. And so it was only Noah and his children. It means that the earth that was repopulated or replenished had to come about via the loins of these three. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, Today we will not, but we are going to show us all the links and show us where the descendants of Shem went, where the descendants of Ham went, where the descendants of Japheth went, where they settled geographically. And we are going to see over time that even in today's world, this 21st century, there are some names of some country which was only changed recently within the time that probably our grandmothers were alive. We all know that Babylon is present day Iraq. We all know that Persia is present day Iran. 
we all know we, we, we will show who present day Germany is. We will show who present day Russia and those around the Caucasus Mountains, who they are, right exactly how the Bible showed them dispersing and the names that they were called from way back. We are going to find that only in recent times the Bible talks about um, Russ. And it talks about Gog, and it talks about Magog. And we are going to find out who these people that in Bible times were called specific names. And it is only in recent history that many of these names were changed. But it is easy to step back and do the checks in terms of going back to the 1800s and the 1700s and the 1600s. And we will be amazed at the names that some of these nations were called. Names that were right here in the book. And so we can know that they went there. The question is, alright, so if this was the son of Japheth, and if this was the son of Shem, and if this was the son of, of Ham, why do we all look so different? Why is it that my skin is dark and yours is brown. Why are some Caucasians and some Indians and, and some Arabs and, and so forth? We will get to that. But it is important to first know that there was a geographical movement, a movement to different geographical locations. And the settlements gives us today a uh, an understanding of who these people are and they literally trace their ancestry and some of them even call the names you know as cl so close of who their founding fathers were and it will amaze some of us but we will get there but suffice it to say we're just doing a survey you now and we want to get some things in line and I want us to look again at the chart so that we can see how it was broken up who were associated with which son and you know pretty much how they dispersed themselves across the spectrum of the den world and later on we will look at where they are located today and it doesn't matter where they are located today it doesn't matter what they have it doesn't matter what they have achieved or how uh, scientifically advanced they are today the fact is the things that were prophesied of them the things that the Bible told us that was going to happen to Gog and to Magog and the Bible calls their names as they were we are looking at germany we are looking at russia we are talking about great nations indeed they might be great nations and they are great nations but in the book it just speaks to what god is going to do to god and to magog what god is going to do to togamar what god is going to do to and it start to call the names of their whole ancestral names but it represents a present day country and we will show who they are. And brothers and sisters, by virtue of a knowledge of all the countries around the world today and carrying them back to their origins in terms of their ancestors, it is going to give more credence to what is written in the book of Genesis so that we will be able even more to accept every account in Genesis as true and authentic and our faith will be builded. Let us look on the slide for division within division number five and see the sons of Noah. So we said that he had three sons, Ham, the father of Canaan, Shem and Japheth. And these three represents the, the ancestry of the modern nations as we have today. Now, Shem, 
The descent, oh, not Shem, Ham, sorry. Let us start with Ham. Go back to the slide. Let us start with Ham. Um, the descendants of Canaan would, according to what their father declared, Ham and his son, or through his son Canaan, would be servants and become the dark-skinned Africans. Now, there is a bit of controversy in this because, you know, folks argue that there was no curse passed down to Canaan and nobody was cursed and God don't curse nobody, etc., etc. And of course, we can understand nobody wants to see themselves as being cursed. But then the Bible said, curse be Canaan. Noah did pronounce a curse and made, the, made it abundantly clear that they were going to be servants and that Japheth would occupy even the tents of Shem. And Ham, not Ham, but Canaan and his descendants would be servants to the others. No, that is very significant. And that was there in scripture. And... Um, so two things here, they are going to be servants, and yes, they are going to be dark-skinned. But then let us move on. Two things we have said there, and we're just kind of skimming as we take our time. The descendants of Shem now would dwell in tents, and ultimately become the Jewish nation, and the Arab nations. Now, mo most folks don't recall, but it would appear to us today that the Arabs and the Jews are poles apart. Most folks are still unaware that the bitterness between the Arabs and the Jews had their origins from way back. Let me remind us that right in the book of Genesis, it tells us that the Arabs and the Jews are brothers. The father of the Arabs and the father of the Jews is Abraham. Now, it rubs rough when those in Christendom hear that Abraham is the father of the Arabs who are Muslims. And Muslims have nothing to do with Christianity. Muslims have, Muslims have nothing to do with Jews. And it, it, it rubs very hard many when they hear and say it's, it cannot be. But the Bible tells us in Genesis, and Genesis gives us a background to a lot of things that are happening in our world today. God promised Abraham, let us take our time, God promised Abraham that through his seed, through him, the nations of the earth is going to be blessed. That was a messianic promise, right? So, in other words, through the lineage of Abraham, Messiah would come and that Messiah would not only bless Israel, the Jewish people, but he would bless all the nations of the earth so that God speaking that word to Abraham was prophetic and it was a messianic prophecy. And it is important that we know that. But when God spoke this to Abraham, Abraham was about 75 years of age. Remember now, he recognized that he was already old. His wife would have been up in her 60s or 70s. She too recognized that she would have been old. And she tried at the last moment because she probably would have crossed the line already at 60 odd. We do know that there are some 60 odd right now that still could have children. So she tried from before they were trying, and they might have gotten word that they would have had children from before that. But when that promise was given, say, you're going to have that son. 
she realized that something was wrong because Abraham was no up in age. She was no up in age. And after a few more years, something just went. So after 75 years of age, when nothing happened, 76, 77, 80, 81, 83, 85, nothing happened. 86. She said, Lo, Abraham, look here. God said through you, the nations of the earth is going to be blessed. Nothing can happen through you again. And we want the nations of the earth to be blessed through you, following us, saints. So hear what you do. I'm going to lend you just for the purpose of having a baby. I'm going to make you go into Hagar and have a surrogate child. In other words, use her to bring about that son so that through him, the nations of the earth will be blessed and the promise of God will be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, in Genesis we are learning. Be careful how we try to help God. Be careful how we try to infuse into any promises of God to us our own thing. Be careful how we try to infuse into the word of God our own thoughts and our own ways. Because there are those that believe that I want the thing to happen and the word says this and we want to do it and the word is clear because God's word was clear that you are going to have the child. But because it's not going a certain way and we're not seeing it happening, it's not lining up with how we think it should happen, we many times make the mistake of stepping out and doing some things to help the process, to help God. I can tell us, God does not need any help from us in that regard. What God wants from us is for us to accept his word, to believe his word, and to live his word. And I cannot overemphasize that point. And that comes out clear right here. Because Sarah took Hagar and gave her to Abraham and said, have a child through her. No, that's a, I don't know what kind of wife is that. Some folks would argue that she was a good wife to do that. Others might argue otherwise. But it was a bad idea. But sometimes when we get desperate, we take things into our own hands. If we're not hearing from God, if we're not sure what is happening, we do our own thing. And that's what she did. But Agar had a son for Abraham, and his name was Ishmael. And Ishmael was the father of the Arab nations. And who was Ishmael's father? Abraham. But by time Abraham, and this happened, this boy child was born to Abraham when he was 86 years of age. And Round about 80, 80, yes, 86 years of age because that son was 13, 14 years older than Isaac. And so when Abraham was now 99 going 100, finally God stepped in and the promise came through. God never misses. God never makes a mistake. And I am telling us that Isaac came according to the word of the Lord. And his father too was Abraham. But God spoke and told Abraham, no, it might sound callous and hard, and told Abraham, said, listen to me now. Follow your wife because the wife, she wants the baby born and Abraham start to look sympathetic to Hagar and he loved his son Ishmael. All of a sudden, Sarah became her, her mind and her heart and everything was turned from this lady. And remember the story. Well, she ran her out 
And God told Abraham, indeed, follow your wife. Send away the bond woman and her son. And they left. And they almost died in the wilderness. But God provided for them. And prophesied too over Ishmael that he too was going to become a great nation. However, messianic prophecy was that the lineage, the Messiah was going to come. Not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. But they are both Abraham's sons. So forget all that we see happening now and understand. So let's go back to the chart. So I want us to see that although there are nations, the nation of Israel and all the Arab nations around, and Saudi Arabia and all of those Arabs over in the Middle East, they are brothers. And if we trace the history back, we go right back to one four parents. And that is what I want us to kind of, in the survey now, get into our systems. Because we are going to give the dispersion later on. And then the final son of Noah was Japheth. And he would be enlarged and dwell in the tents of Shem. And who are these people that are the, the descendants of Japheth? They were the, who we call the Romans. You remember the Roman Empire? The Greeks, the English, the Irish. These are all European nations. And notice that they had dominion over the Middle Eastern nations, just as Noah indicated that Japheth will dwell in the, he, 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 they are going to rule in the tents of Shem. In other words, they're going to dominate them. And if we look at the history of the world, up to very recent, all over, when it wasn't the British, it was the Romans, it was the Greek. They all had, were on, even in Jesus' time, it was the Romans that had their feet in the tents of Shem. The Romans literally controlled the entire Palestine during that period. Yes, and so the promise was so true. So when we look at <coughs> Ham, Ham descendants populated the African continent. When we look at Shem, the, he was the father of the Hebrew and the father of the Arab nation, the tent dwellers. And then when we look at Jap Japheth, all, they were the Caucasians, and they settled uh, across the Caucasus Mountains, where we have Russia, yes, we are, we, and we have those other people in continental Europe. So those are the descendants of Japheth. So that we are seeing now that the spread covers a large, large continental Europe, large continental Africa, and there were other places that others went in Asia and so forth. But I'm going to show us later on who are those that are in Asia. But just to make the point... And, and to, to outline something very important. Notice, all of these folks, Ham, continental Africa. Shem, over there in the Middle East, where the Jews and the Arabs have their dwelling right now. Japheth, across the Caucasus Mountains, taking in Russia, all across Europe, the Romans, the Greek, the English, all of those folks are his descendants. But I want us to bear in mind something, and it is important. I waited until now to make this point, because here it is that they have dispersed themselves, yes, across the world. 
And so there are different peoples, they speak different languages, uh, they have different customs and everything. And we, we quite accept that. But there is something that I find very, very interesting. And we see it going back. We see it in, I think it is in the chapter, I'm trying to get the chapter for us. In chapter 6. And I wait until this time to, a simple point, but very significant. I wait until this particular point to raise it. I'm telling us this book of Genesis, so very significant, as simple as it is. But the Bible tells us, and I made mention of it earlier, about the flood. The Bible tells us that the flood came and covered the earth. And only one family was saved, but it was a worldwide flood. Now, as wherever or however vast worldwide was at that time, well, folks argue about that, but it was massive. It went right across the then known world. And it was known and felt by people everywhere in the then known world. That is facts. There are folks that would tell us that it couldn't be and it was only a, a small flood in a small area and only a small amount of people know about it. And you know, there are those that suppose the scholars that would indicate to us or try to let us know that it is impossible for there to have been a flood all around so that everybody could know about it. It couldn't be so wide. It couldn't be so, it, it's impossible. But the Bible tells us that the windows of heaven, so the rain came down from above, heavy, thunderous. It also tells us that the fountains of the deep, which are reservoirs, it means reservoirs, so that water is in the earth, and it came up also. Many folks prior to a certain time did not realize and recognize that water was under the earth. It is long, long after that folks found out that within the earth there were untold measures of water. When they heard about water, the only way that they knew at some point, well afterwards, they started to dig wells and they knew that water was there. And you can know, but they dig wells and then water come up. So water is in the earth. And so the Bible said that the fountains of the deep, the reservoirs that are below, burst open. So water like sand, water galore came up. So water was coming from below, water was coming from above. It did a great, or caused a great destruction and it caused a massive flood. And this is what the Bible said. No. There's one thing that most folks have never taken time out to look at, and it is so real, and it stares at us. Have you ever taken the time to look at the different cultures, the different groups around, the Chinese, the Indians, the Africans, look at the Arabs, look at the Jews, look at the... Europeans go back into their history, and I'm talking about history in recent history. I'm talking about the 1600s, the 1500s. In these, in this after Christ era, go and check, even today, in the archives of a lot of these cultures. Every single one of them have a record that speak to a great flood in their area. Everyone, just do a little research. Bring it up. 
check the Africans, check the Chinese, check the history of the Indians. They all give an account of a flood that took place in their area. What is it? How is it that everybody could talk about a flood as a part of their ancestral history? Because these are things that came down from way back. And folks don't even realize that in the early days, you know, you see when we had Adam, and then Adam had his son Cain, and then Cain killed Abel, but then Adam had Seth, and then they had children, and they gave the names coming down and Methuselah and all the others. Listen, you see, by the time Noah was around, those men, and I'm going to give us the chart, so much to look at, but we, we, we miss the point that people like Seth was, goes all the way down to the time near Noah's period. It is most folks don't realize that Adam lived for 900 years. And by the time they were like 100 and odd, they had, they, they had children. So for the next 800 years, you know how many generations they span? And so a lot of the things, a lot of the things that these people way down, coming down to the time of Noah, a lot of the things that they knew, it, most folks believe, because the Bible tells us, Seth, the son of Noah, knew Abraham. Most folks didn't know that. Based on, based on his age, they were contemporaries. In fact, as we go through, we are going to come back to Melchizedek. I do believe that Melchizedek was a theophany of God, but there is strong arguments by many that Melchizedek might very well have been Seth, who knew everything that had happened because his daddy, his granddaddy, if you know who those men were, they were contemporaries. Seth's grandfather would have known Abraham. I'm going to come show us the chart. I'm going to come and show us how far and how they overlapped and who would have known who in that small arena. And we would be surprised to know. We would be surprised to know. And so I want us to take the time and to understand that this breakdown in ethnic groups, this breakdown in the dispersion of nations, this looking back now to see that actually every nation have the same historical account in their little ethnic group with their language. And they, some of them have it drawn, inscribed in rocks as to what happened. They all spoke about a flood. How is that? Simply, they all came from a common source. And that source was right around at that time. And I am sure that Ham, Shem, and Japheth was able to tell their children and their grandchildren and others down the line about the flood. And they inscribed. So as they moved about into the different areas, they would have gone with the same experience. That's the only way you could explain how so many varying nations spread across the world today have the same story in their language. And notice, you know, is the same story, but it is in English. Is the same story, but it is in Ara Arabic. 
it is the same story, but it is in Hebrew. It is the same story, and it is in the different languages around. How so? Because at the time when it was common, something else happened. They were all together. It was a common experience until something else happened that dispersed them across, changed their languages. And every man with the same language went one way, one way, one place, one place. But while they understood each other for those that spoke English, while they understood each other for those that spoke Aramic, they were able to describe and to still discuss and to still make note and to still put it into history some of the things that they would have heard passing down from generation to generation. It came from a common source. We are coming from a common place with common experiences and in the different languages that we are seeing, they are all speaking about the same thing in today's language. I submit to us, brothers and sisters, that the thing that we are outlining is true, it is real. And if we just take the time and look at our modern history, it gives us a, an understanding that we are coming from a common source, a common ancestral background and I want us to bear that in mind. Let's go back to the slide as we run through and try to wrap up because it's easy to, to get sidetracked. So we have the slide up. All right, so Genesis, and we're still on division number five. And so we are basically going to take our time and move to the next. Genesis chapter 10 indicates separate locations for the children of Noah. We, had, we, had, we have gone through that, all right? And we, have rea we now realize that God told Noah and his children to multiply and replenish, spread across the earth. Now notice what is happening here now. Nimrod led the descendants of Noah in rebellion against God. Now, we said it earlier. You remember we spoke about the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain. The descendants of Cain were ungodly, unrighteous. They didn't pursue God. But when Seth was born, then the Bible said men began to call on the name of the Lord. And so it was a godly, righteous family line. But by a certain time, by a certain time, um, they were influenced, that the descendants of Seth were influenced by the unrighteous descendants of Cain. And to the point where they literally, their works came up as a stench before the nostrils of God. People who once were righteous. Now, here it is that God saved three, um, Noah and his children, his sons and his daughters. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and his children, his family. And they were in the ark and they were saved. They were now the basis by which earth was going to be repopulated, replenished. And they were instructed to replenish, which means to have children, to, to spread out. That was the instruction from God. But now Nimrod came on the scene. Bible talks about him and describes him as a mighty hunter. And Nimrod led the descendants of Noah. Remember Noah, you know? Those descendants were supposed to be righteous. And they were coming down and they were following God. But just as in the case that we spoke about earlier, we're seeing it again. Learn the lessons, saints of the Most High God. Nimrod rebelled against God. 
and Nimrod led the descendants of Noah in rebellion against God. Look here, these are things that ha are happening, have been happening from the beginning. It is the nature of how Satan works in the heart of men and nothing is new. And there's always a man that seems somehow allowed adversary Satan to use him or to use her and to get into the thick of things and it is somehow the norm if we are not careful if we don't guard our minds that the unrighteous tends to lead away the righteous from serving God and that is why we find folks that are in the church and after a while they want to leave they want to go back to the things of the world. They are being led astray. Don't watch what they say and how they say it. They feel that they want a certain level of freedom to do certain things, which serving God the way that God established for us to serve him is not going to allow for certain things. So there is always that fighting. There is always that struggle. And we are seeing that Nimrod got the upper hand with the descendants of Noah who were righteous people and who were saved in the ark. Everybody else died and they were saved. And yet Nimrod led them in rebellion, rebellion against God. They grouped together in the plain of Shinar and built a tower. That means that mean they are they are literally they are literally not going anywhere they are literally not going anywhere they are literally not going anywhere and yet god told them to multiply to replenish spread out because god wanted the earth to be populated and they literally, because of Nimrod, rebelled against what God told them to do, decided that they were going to group themselves together, and they started to build a tower. And look, the tower was designed to be the focal point of their new... Boy, I tell you, from the very beginning, there is always that tendency to want to have our own way, and to worship God how we feel like, or to worship whichever God we want to worship. And that presented itself in Genesis, in the, in the dispersion of nations, the, the fifth division, chapters 10 and 11. Let me tell us, it is no different today. And I am happy that we can go back to the beginnings and recognize, we can learn, we can see it, how the adversary operates, the tendency that we have as men to gravitate, I imagine, because of our humanity and because of the nature of sin, which, but we have to now know and learn from what we are seeing in these books, what we are seeing as we serve here Genesis. Look, Satan did what he did, and the righteous people somehow got sucked in and they no, were now defying the word of God. Instead of going across the whole earth, they gathered together, built a tower, which was the focal point of their own form of worship and worshiping God. They decided that they are going to do it on their terms. And God spoiled their plan by confusing their speech, their language, and scattering them. The Tower of Babel, brothers and sisters, stands as a warning of God's divine judgment on those who rebel against him and form their own system of worship, their own way to serve God, to do it on my terms, be careful, this is exactly what Nimrod did. This is exactly his style. This is exactly his mode of operation. 
and we must be very, very careful. And so let us just continue. because I think the time is on us. We are going to be wrapping up shortly for today. And so I just want to get into the sixth division and probably we just look at Abraham and then we pick up on we pick up on the division seven next week, which is Isaac. But important to note that Genesis, and we are now into division chapter six, so we are just spreading across and just giving uh, a survey uh, coming across. We are now into the, the patriarchs. We are now into looking at the, the Jewish nation, the father of the Jewish nation, and chapters 12, uh, to 50 gives us the overall coverage, but chapters 12 to 25 uh, talks to us about Abraham himself, the father of the faithful. Notice that Genesis chapters 1 to 11 covers approximately 2,000 years, or about the same amount of time as was covered by the rest of the Bible. And some folks might ask why. And it is simply because the Bible is mainly a history of redemption. So more time is given to looking at the history of redemption and the redemption story itself than the time that is given to look at the history of nation. That is only a kind of, you know, in passing thing. But the bulk of scripture is given to the whole story of redemption and that is very important for us to know and if you notice that redemption the plan the prophecy of it started from as early as genesis chapter number three so the, the redemption the messianic promise the the prefiguring of the rapture and all of these things brothers and sisters they are in the book of genesis and we are happy that we are taking the time and we go through. And we go through. Now, the section on the story of Abraham is devoted more space than to the first 2,000 years of human history. Again, that is bringing into focus the point that we are making. Because he has more space, more things in terms of what is allocated to Abraham. More is written about him. And look at over the period that we started off with, with chapters 1 to 11. It spoke about so many other things in, that, in those 11 chapters. And yet, Abraham alone is in 11 chapters. The first 11 chapters spoke about the creation. It spoke about, it spoke about the fall. It spoke about so many things in 11 chapters. And yet, this more, just a little more than 11 chapters, is speaking solely about Abraham and what he is going to do, what is going to be accomplished through him, his role in the whole redemption process. It is significant and it is simply saying to us that when it comes to redemption, when it comes to God's plan for us, it is taking up most of the space because that is what is most important and this man is the father of faithful and the whole story of redemption is going to now start to come together because Messiah who is going to come is going to come via and through the loins of this great father of faith so it is very very important that we see this now Abraham was a rich and powerful man in Ur of the Chaldees and the Bible tells us some things. Here is this man quite comfortable where he was, doing what he was doing. And God appeared to him and told him a couple of things. One, leave your country. Two, leave your kindred. So all of those extended family members going back that you're familiar with and you know and you leave them. Three, leave your father's house. Four, go to a place that you don't know, but I go and show you. I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of hard when you look at it and it caused folks, it caused folks to, you know, say, boy, this is kind of, why would God 
do such a thing like that. But then there is, this is probably one of the things that make God look at Abraham the way he looked at him. You know, because the man was just willing because he now knew, he you now had a relationship with God. And it is important, brothers and sisters, to have a relationship with God. And he had a relationship with God. And so when God told him to act, he acted. And God promised to make Abraham a great nation. He promised to bless him. He promised to make his name great. He promised to bless all the families of the earth through him. And as I said earlier, this last promise is a messianic promise. It speaks to the fact that through him, Messiah was going to come. And that Messiah, later on in history, in the millennium, is going to sit on the throne of David and is going to rule the entire earth. Yes, and without going into all the details, it is going to be a time of peace, a time of contentment, a time of togetherness, because Jesus, the Messiah, that was spoken about from Genesis chapter 3, is going, the day is going to come. And I'm saying to us, brothers and sisters, it is real, it is a fact, the time is going to come, and Jesus is going to sit in the same way that we know that Abraham was real, in the same way that we know that the things that we have looked at coming down from chapter 1 of Genesis and looking in context of all that we have been saying already and we are now getting the sense that these things are real. I am submitting to us, I am saying to us that the things are real. We are at this juncture in time, but there were many, many years before us and the things that we have submitted to us Brothers and sisters, they are real, they happened, and the things that are to come. They, a great nation, indeed, Israel was, and is, and will become, because they are going to be the premier nation at that time. Right now, folks look at them, and they say, they are just a little speck over there, and everybody is taking advantage of them. But their greatness will not be seen and known and recognized until Messiah the Prince is here, and he will come, brothers and sisters, he is coming, and it is closer than we literally, it is closer than we literally think. And so that is to come also. God promised to bless Abraham, and that God did. God promised to make his name great, and that God did. His name is not only great in the land of Israel, his, his name is not only great amongst the Jews, his name is great amongst the Arabs. His name is great amongst the Muslims. But not only those two groups, his name is great amongst the Christians. His name is great right across the globe between Christianity, Judaism, and Muslim. is is 90% of the world's population. And Abraham's name is great in all that sphere. This is a great name. It is only Jesus as a name that is greater than Abraham himself. Not even Moses. Moses was confined to the Jewish people. The, the, the Arabs, the Muslim nation, don't recognize Moses as the Jews do, or even us as Christians do. But Abraham spans the Arab Muslim world. Abraham spans the Jewish world. Abraham spans the Christian world. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. We might not have taken the time to look at it and to recognize it, but this is exactly what it is. And God made his name great and God bless him. And what is left out of that promise, brothers and sisters, and I, I, it, it will be good for us to read it, what is great, what is left out of that promise is this number four, to bless all the nations, all the families of the earth through him, the messianic promise. And so Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 tells us, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. 
and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I am saying to us, brothers and sisters, God have fulfilled his word. We, are, we have seen it happen in all the other arenas. And the era that is left to be fulfilled is that last section that says, And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that is about to happen. And so some highlights of Abraham's life includes his call to go to Canaan, then his descent down into Egypt, his separation from Lot, his deliverance of Lot from captivity. We will come back to this because we want to spend a little time because it's in the book of Genesis and some of the things we're going to talk about. Now his deliverance from, of the deliverance of Lot from captivity, what is that all about? It is here that we for the first time heard about Melchizedek. And we are going to drill in to find out who was Melchizedek and what he represents. And it is all in the book of Genesis. And we are going to find that Melchizedek represented an order. He was both the king of Salem and he was priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek was a king and a priest. First ever. And this is at a time when there was no nation called Israel yet. And therefore there was no Moses and there was no law and there was no Levi from whom the priest came. So how then was this man around in Genesis being called a priest and nothing was ever spoken or declared that there was a priestly line or there was a priest to come. It was never mentioned and yet out of nowhere Melchizedek come and say he's a priest of the most high God. Remember the, the priesthood began. With Moses and Aaron. Yes, and Levi was the tribe through whom the priests came. They were only in the lions of Abraham at that time. And it reached to the point where Abraham or Abraham actually paid tithes to Melchizedek. But I just say that we'll go back to that. But it's very significant. We have to go back to it. Right? So we just want to take time and go through the survey. So highlights of the life of Abraham. So yes, he was separated from Lot and then he delivered Lot from captivity. These are significant features, significant things that happened in his life. His reception of God's covenant and the whole matter of justification by faith. What a God. And then the circumcision. A sign of the covenant. This is the man, yes, that circumcision started out with. Then the annunciation of Isaac's birth and the intercession for Sodom when Sodom was going to be destroyed. What a man, a man that loved people and he prayed to God for Sodom, yet he could not save them. Then he had to, in chapter 21, I mentioned it earlier on, he dismissed Agar and Israel, it hurt him, Ishmael. He dismissed Agar and Ishmael. And yes, it did hurt him, but he had to do it. God required it, and he did it. Then the son, Isaac, the promised son that was born to him, God, he was told to go offer him as a sacrifice. And you know what Abraham did? He went to offer him. Offer up your only son in terms of promise. And you're going to offer him, God gave it to you, a miracle son, the son of promise. And now you're going to offer him on the mountain as a sacrifice. It speaks to something greater that was to come. And we're going to take the time and go through. Then now, he had to get a bride for his son Isaac. Then we went on to see him having more children by Keturah, and finally we see the death of Abraham in the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis. What a life, 
what a survey, what a man. And Abraham, what we see coming out of all of what we have looked at over the life of this man is that he was a man that obeyed God and he was a man of faith. And that is so very important. His obedience and his faith in God stands as a memorial to all generation. And that is important. Brothers and sisters, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 19, gives us a nice little history of that, a nice little history of that. And it is important. And I, I really want to wrap it up at this point. When we get back, we go into division, uh, the seventh division, which is looking at the life of Isaac. But it's important to note that obedience to God and faith in your God are critical. This stands as a memorial in the life of our father Abraham. And all the things that we have said, all the things that we have just barely touched on as we survey the book of Genesis, we are seeing as we look into his life that if we are going to achieve, we must obey God. If we are going to get to the place, we must have faith in God. And that is crucial. Abraham teaches us to believe God. Even if it hurt, believe God. Even if we don't understand what is happening, believe God. He was told to go to a place that him don't know and him just, he just went. And we learn from that. All the things that are there, we want us to take the time out. We want us to focus on what we can extract from the book. And I want us, brothers and sisters, don't just take the things that we are seeing and the survey and say this is good information. Of course it's good information. Make note of the information. But extract the points of learning. Extract the things that we see as principles. Extract and apply the things that we... So Bible study is important to gain information, to gain knowledge. But it is also important to put the thing into our space and our experience and apply ourselves because the word is living and we must adjust ourselves and align ourselves with the word. And I'm happy that so much is there to learn from what would just normally seem to be a simple book of information and history. It is a book full of promises. It is a book full of uh, experiences that we can learn from. It is a book filled with principles that we can apply. And I want us as we go through. So we are going to learn some things when we get back now to drilling into some of the things. Like we're going to learn from Melchizedek and who he was and what he represents. We're going to learn about even tithing. We're going to learn quite a bit from this simple book of Genesis. But let us continue to take the time. T continue to take the time, continue to just survey in brief so that we have a little idea of what each of the chapters represents and therefore a picture of the book and then we start to drill into some of the areas that we know later on will, will open up our mind and expand, clearly expand upon what we already know and show that there is still so much more that we can get. So God bless you. Um, we close off for this evening. And God's willing, next week, same time, we should be here for Bible study as we continue on the book of Genesis. The Lord bless you real good in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your presence again. We thank you, mighty God, for another evening, another time when we can sit down and just take our time and go through the word. Thank you for the study that we are on. I pray that you will continue to touch our minds and our hearts. I pray that you will open our understanding, mighty God, more and more, so that we can grasp and hold on to the words of Almighty God. Let your name be glorified. 
Let your perfect will be done in our lives. Help us to apply the word and to live for you and to just give glory to the name of our Lord and our great God, Jesus Christ. We bless you, Lord. We honor you and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. The Lord richly bless you. We thank you again for tuning in. And God's willing, next week we continue in his great name. The Lord bless you.